Okay, hey, welcome everyone. It looks like people are coming on in. Oh my gosh. And we've got people from New York and Maine and North Carolina and Western Mass. Um, welcome to everyone. We're so excited that you're all here today. Um, I am going to, oops, whoops, I keep doing that. Um, <laughs> I'm going, my name is um, Nell Hood and I'm going to kick us off today. And then, um, pass the ball to Emily Bysden, who will lead us through this really exciting workshop about how to sow native seeds. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And so hopefully you'll be able to see some of us right now. Um, here we go. Oh, this is great. So much, so many people from all over the place. I'm so glad you're all here. Um, so as we get started, I'm going to open up the right things. Okay, wonderful. Well, it is 4.02, so I think we're gonna get going. Um, we are so glad you're all here. Um, my name is Nell Hood, and I am the lead of educational programs here at the Wild Seed Project. And I'm so excited to have all of you join us for the seed sowing workshop on this snowy January day in, um, here where we are in Maine, I don't know if it's snowing where you are, but um, we got some about six inches of fresh stuff today. So it's a very exciting day. Um, as we begin this program that will engage us in planting seeds of place, um, we want to begin by recognizing that the land we are leading this program from, that we here at Wild Seed Project and many of us on this Zoom are tied to in so many ways is the unceded Wabanaki territory we now call Maine. We recognize the inherent sovereignty of the tribes of the Wabanaki Confederacy, <clears throat> the people of the Don, the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy, and honor their relationships to the plants, animals, and other beings that have been threatened and displaced through settler colonialism. We encourage you all who are here with us today to learn more about the historical and present day relationships of indigenous peoples to the places you live. The purpose of this acknowledgement is to allow this knowledge to shape our work. Our work is dependent on understanding and reckoning with the history and present day violence of colonization. The exploitative practices of colonialism are directly responsible for the displacement of people and these important native plants that form the foundations of our local food webs. From this understanding, we can ask ourselves, what does it mean to build and rebuild reciprocal relationships with people, plants, fungi, soil, water, and air? Reestablishing resilient ecosystems in which all forms of life can thrive is an important action in deconstructing colonial legacy. We have all gathered here today to learn more about reestablishing native plant life. Let the knowledge of the roots and the breadth of the legacy of displacement guide us today as we do this work. We also want to recognize that while we are leading this program today and very excited to be sharing these resources, these skills and information did not start nor will they end with us. We are sharing the collection of teachings from so many teachers, both human and non-human. At Wild Seed Project, we know the best way to learn how to sow seeds is to watch plants sow their own seeds and try and replicate that process as best we can. <clears throat> as best we can. We send gratitude to all of our teachers as we start this lesson today. If you are new to Wild Seed Project, we are a small nonprofit based in North Yarmouth, Maine, working to give communities the resources they need to reestablish native plants and thus build and rebuild biodiversity, habitat, and climate resilience in the places we all live, work, and play. We do this by distributing seeds ethically collected from wild populations, at, and we dis also distribute the educational materials needed to plant them to create resilient landscapes. A lot of the education we do is through programs just like this one, and today we'll be walking through the steps of sowing native seeds in the winter to ensure the best chance of their germination. I'm now going to hand it over to Emily and our seed cam, who will walk us through all the details, so I'm going to take a second to spotlight both of them, and um, yeah, we're really excited to get started. Hello. Thank you all for coming today. Um, cool. I'm Emily Baisden. I'm the seed program manager here at Wild Seed Project. Um, and I'm going to walk you guys through the basics of native seed sowing. 
Um, as Nell said, the best time to sow native seeds is in the winter or late fall. Um, lately, falls have been so warm, it's kind of best to wait until winter. And days like this are really the perfect day or days right before you're going to get some snow and ice. And like Nell said earlier, if you think about the way these plants have evolved in nature, um, a lot of them go to seed in the fall time. Um, and those seeds are not only adapted for this type of climate, going through these freezes and thaws, um, but a lot of them have evolved to require that in order to break their hard seed coats and to germinate. Um, so it's really important to try to do that um, as naturally as possible, and it helps these plants to be adapted. Um, so I'm going to go over all of the things that we do here at Wild Seed Project and that we encourage people to do for how to sow their seeds. So first, I'm going to talk about the supplies that we use. Um, first off, you're going to want a pot. Um, something that's a solid plastic pot um, tends to be the best. You can use terracotta too. Things like the peat pots or the cow pie pots um, aren't so great for uh, native seed sowing because they have to survive several months, including winter and rain. Um, and the cow pots are really great for vegetables because you can put them right in the ground and they dissolve away, um, but you don't want that for a native plant. Um, I do like to tell people, think about all of the vegetable seeding that you do. Um, and forget it, because a lot of the things are very different um, when you're doing native seed sowing. One of those things is the type of pots that you can use. Um, you want something that can handle freezes and thaws. And because we plant them in the winter and then we don't tend to, um, we, we sow them in the winter, we don't tend to plant them until the fall. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So you need something that can last um, and it's reusable for forever, hopefully. Um, so you need your pot. And then you need your soil. Um, so I have with me some potting soil here. Um, and the best kind of potting soil that we find works is a compost-based potting soil. Um, the peat-based stuff tends to be a sterile mix, which means it doesn't have the microorganisms in it that like a compost-based potting soil will have. Um, it's also peat, which means that it was probably unethically harvested. And a lot of those are like the miracle grow type um, soils that also have a bunch of fertilizers and chemicals. And we encourage everyone to plant organic as much as they possibly can. Um, because remember, these are to reestablish native populations. Um, and therefore, we want them to be food. We want them to be healthy in an ecosystem and not have any um, nasty chemicals in them. Um, so the other thing that you're going to want are labels. Um, I like these four inch labels. Um, the longer ones tend to get more brittle and they can break off in a winter pretty easily. Um, so these, and these ones can get stuck all the way down into your pot um, and they don't tend to disappear in the winter the way the tall ones seem to for me. Um, and the same thing with the plastic is nice because it will actually last. Um, but what I use to write on the labels, instead of those um, greenhouse markers that they sell, I use just a regular number two pencil, the soft tip. Um, and it, it actually lasts longer than the markers usually do. And you can erase them and reuse them if you want to. Um, so that's a pretty big benefit. Um, and the next thing you're going to need is sand. I've got my thing of sand here that we cover our seeds with after we plant them rather than covering them in soil. Um, the sand has a lot of good benefits. One thing is that it just holds the seeds in place a little bit better than soil does. Um, and the other thing is that it allows light to actually pierce through so they can um, get a better germination. And the type of seed sand that we use is just a coarse ground builder's sand. Um, it's one of the things we get the most questions about. So I brought my now finally almost empty bag. Um, I just use the regular quick Crete all purpose sand. It's like a washed coarse ground builder sand. Um, the big thing is, is that you don't want any chemicals in your sand, any ice melt and things like that. Um, but it's nice to have that coarse ground. It seems to work a little bit better than uh, sandbox sand, though you can't use that in a pinch. The only downfall is that they only come in 50 pound bags or larger. So it's good to have some friends to sew together or you find other projects for it because you're rarely going to need a whole 50 pound bags unless you're me or running a nursery. <laughs> um, so that's the sand. Um, the next thing you're going to want to get is some wire mesh. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the wire mesh later, but I like this quarter inch um, wire mesh. You can get it with like a plastic coating too. It seems to last a little longer with that, but the quarter inch is 
kind of the perfect size to keep little critters from getting into your plants. You use it to cover your pots or you can put it over a cold frame um, and cover your pots that way. But you really need to use something that's gonna protect your seeds from creatures and other things that will take off. Um, remember native animals really like eating native seeds. So therefore we have to protect ours until they are established enough that a nibble won't hurt them. Um, so the next thing that you're going to want is probably the most important thing is your seeds. Um, I encourage people to buy a few different species of seed or collect a few different species if you do it ethically. Um, it just gives you more diversity and it also gives you more chance of um, success. If you try a few different things, at least something's probably going to come up. Um, so I'm going to go over a few different species and show you how to sow them. And the last thing that you need is a watering can. Something that I've noticed with winter sowing is that your soil is either frozen or really dried out. Um, so I um, put water in my soil before I even um, pot it up, but then I also make sure to water my plants after I've seeded them. Um, so it's good to have a nice watering can that has um, like a fine water sprinkle so that it doesn't just like splash all your seeds out when you go to water. Um, so it's, it's important to kind of note, it, note that um, to do a gentle watering or make sure your soil is really, really wet before you put uh, your seeds in. So that is it for the supplies. Um, I am gonna go over the three different species or four different species that I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'm gonna start with butterfly milkweed. Um, and with our wild seed project seeds, um, one packet of seed is usually enough for one four inch pot. Um, sometimes there's more in a package and you can spread them out into two, but generally speaking, they work for one four inch pot. Um, so I'm gonna use this nice plate that you can see in the picture, the seed cam here, um, cause it'll show you your seeds a little bit better and I can hold it up to the cam. Um, so I've got butterfly milkweed here, host plant to the monarchs. It's the real important one these days that people are really excited about. Um, we can't seem to keep it on the shelves here. Um, and you wanna sow your seeds really quite close together. Unlike vegetable seeding, um, it's a lot different than, um, than vegetable seedling where, where you don't want them close to each other and you're, you want pretty much exactly the right amount for like a six pot get six seeds sort of thing. Um, but these guys, native seeds really wanna be clumped together. Um, so you can get an idea of how tightly packed you want them to be. And that's about a four inch square amount there. Um, and you're gonna sprinkle them on the top of your pot. So I'm gonna pick up this pot as a little example here. Um, and you can just put the seeds in your hand and sprinkle them over the pot. Just to clarify, there was a question in the chat. This is butterfly milkweed. A different, um, a similar, uh, or part of the milkweed family. Um, the one we most know is common milkweed. Yeah, so um, Maine is home to a few different species of milkweed. Um, there's there's several, any Asclepius, which is the genus of milkweed, um, can feed the monarch butterfly, but it's best to pick species that are native or historically native to your area. Um, Maine has several, some of them no longer grow in the wild in Maine, but they are, were once native here um, or once established here and they're extirpated from the state. And butterfly milkweed is one of those species. So butterfly milkweed, swamp milkweed, common milkweed and poke milkweed are the common or the used to be native species to Maine. Um, and if you can see that in the seed cam there, nice even spread. Um, and then you wanna put your sand over your pot. Um, so our rule of thumb is to do an equal to the amount of sand to the depth of the seed. So if you've got a quarter inch seed, you want about a quarter inch of sand. Um, and you just sprinkle it carefully over the top. You get it nice to the corners. We are finding um, with climate change, things have gotten a little bit weird when it comes to weather, um, where we're getting these really intense uh, storms with lots and lots of rain in a short amount of time. 
Um, and for the seeds that don't require sun to germinate, we've been adding a little bit more sand than we normally would um, to help keep the seeds from splashing out or from um, washing away because two inches of rain in a very short amount of time is an awful lot of rain. Um, and that's kind of becoming a norm um, these days. So you've got your seeds nice and covered here. And then I would go ahead and water this outside and add it into my seed plot. And I'll talk about that, what to do with them once I've got everything sown. Oh, and the next super important thing that Heather would kill me if I forgot is putting your label in. <laughs> um, for my labels, I write the species and then I write the date that I sewed it on the back of the label. Um, and I shove it all the way down into the pot, like I said earlier, and it's good to go outside. All right, that brings me to my next species. I'm going to talk about, um, so that was one of our larger seeds. Now I'm going to talk about some of our really small seeds that we use. Um, and Emily, just for clarification, um, some people are wondering how much soil you put in the pot and what size they are. Yeah, I have an empty pot here, so I'll give you the example for these guys, um, for my tiny seeds. So for the pots, um, we don't fill them all the way to the top. I give a nice lip. Um, so that once again for the rain and um, giving them room for growth. One thing that you can do is you can fill your pot to the top here and use another pot to tamp it down. And you wanna press your soil a lot firmer than you would um, like a vegetable seedling or something like that because of those heaves and freezes and thaws. Um, and, and the light fluffy stuff will just suck a seed in or blow a seed away. So you want, want it nice and firmly packed down um, and really level once again, just so that all your seeds don't end up in one corner um, of the, the pot. So nice firm press down and nice and even layer. And that's about that. Um, I go, a little bit lower than I used to, just to, to have a little bit more room um, for snow and rain and things like that. So on the plate, the example I'm gonna give you guys is black-eyed coneflower, because it's a nice dark seed. Um, and then I'll show you blue vervain in the actual pot. So for these seeds, when you buy our seed, they'll have a germination code on them. Um, and some of them will, a lot of them have the code that says that they require some period of cold to germinate. Um, but it's good to know, I get a lot of questions about the ones that say you could, that they don't require it. Most of those, well, they all can have a cold period and most of them also do a little bit better with a nice cold period. Um, so you don't have to worry about that so much, but you do have to keep an eye on whether it is a plant that needs to be sown immediately, um, like our wet stratified species, or if it's a plant that um, requires light to germinate, which is our blue vervain that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so this is about the amount of seed that you're going to want to put in your pot for um, black-eyed coneflower. And that's going to be about the same amount that you would do for blue vervain. Um, but blue vervain is a lighter seed, so I'm going to actually put it right into the pot for everyone. And the other thing about blue vervain is that it requires sun to germinate. So not only is it a very tiny seed, but it also requires light to germinate. So we're going to do a very tiny dusting of sand, just enough to really hold the seeds in place, um, and not so much that it's going to make it too dark for them to be able to germinate. Sprinkle my seed here. And the reason that we um, like to grow them in pots rather than broadcast um, seed them, like throwing seed out into the um, landscape, there's a lot of reasons, but a lot of it is because they're contained. You can choose where they end up. They're less likely to wash away. Um, and if you think about in the wild, what seeds, what plants produce seed. They produce thousands, hundreds of seed. Um, and how many of those actually become an adult plant? 
only probably one, <laughs> maybe none sometimes. And sometimes it takes them years to become a plant. Um, so that's what will happen if you broadcast seed. That's less likely for them to actually come to adulthood. Um, so that's why we like to use these pots. Um, so if you could see here, our little spread of blue vervain, and I'm gonna do like salting your food, <laughs> um, a very, very small amount of sand, just enough to hold these seeds in place. I still want to be able to, to see the seed. Okay, and then I put my blue vervain label in and I set it aside. Now, the last species I'm going to talk about are our seeds that have um, fluffy seed heads to them or fluffy tails to them. Um, so I'm going to do New England aster. It's really a staple native plant in our area. Beautiful purple flowers, um, water loving, just an all around great important pollinator plant. Um, and we leave the fluff on our seeds. Not every seed grower um, leaves them on, but because we tell people to plant them outside, um, we're okay with leaving them on. The larger scale sellers have machines that remove the fluff um, from the seed, and we don't have one of those machines. The reason that you would potentially remove the fluff um, is because it can get moldy if you're growing them in like a greenhouse condition where it's really humid, um, but you don't have that issue when you're growing them outside. So just like with the other seeds, we do a nice even spread across the top. And then with these guys, they're a pretty small seed, um, but there's a lot of fluff involved. So you really wanna put just enough sand to hold that fluff down so that um, it doesn't rise up and float away on you. Um, one good thing to do with this type of seed is to check it after a few days um, and just make sure your all of your seeds haven't risen up above the sand because that can happen. Um, Just want to get the sand all the way to the corner here. And it's okay to see some fluff coming up through the sand. That's that's good. And there we go. And then if they rise up and you, after you checked it after a few days, you can just sprinkle some more sand on, um, no problem. So I put my label in and I've got my three species here all ready to go with their different amounts of sand. Um, and now what you're gonna do is you're gonna water them with a gentle nozzle and you're gonna put them outside somewhere in the shade um, and somewhere protected with your wire mesh. Um, Chicken wire is not going to work because animals can get through it. A lot of people will use old cold frames that they um, put the wire over. You can also just unroll your wire and put some bricks on top. Um, and that is totally enough. Um, that's what I do at my house. <laughs> um, and then you kind of just let them sit throughout the winter. And you want to start checking on them in March or April when things start to warm up. Um, and you wanna check for germination. Each species is gonna be different the way they germinate um, and the times that they germinate. And one of the things that um, wild plants have adapted to for a survival mechanism is that they don't all germinate at the same time. Unlike vegetable seedlings that are bred to all have specific germination rates where they germinate within specific number of days and you can really calculate it out. Um, these wild plants don't tend to do that because for survival, it's better for them to germinate at various different rates. Um, so it's good to, to 
keep an eye on them and start watering them once spring comes, depending on how wet of a spring it is. Um, and then once they start to grow up, your sun loving species, you can move out of the shade into a sunnier location, but keep an eye on keeping them watered. And then you wanna grow them on throughout the entire growing season, throughout spring and summer. And then most of them should be big enough to be planted in the fall, um, unless it is a species that requires two years of germination, which like I said, keep an eye on what your um, germination codes are because some of them require two winters and two springs. Um, the one, one thing that I get a lot of questions about is, um, what do I do if my plants start growing and they don't fit in their pot anymore? And you can do a couple different things. Um, one thing is to just take the whole pot and flip the plant out. The roots should all hold together and you can put it right into a bigger pot with more soil. And that's probably the best way for the basic home grower, home grower to do it because um, then you still have your big pot of plants and you can plant it in your garden later in the year. Um, what we do in the nursery, um, or if you want to have multiple clumps of plants, is we'll take them out of the pot and divide them into a few clumps and give, give put them into a few different pots. The one thing to note about that is unlike vegetable seedlings, you're not going to want to divide them to be individual plants. You're still going to want to keep them in nice clumps. Um, it's better for the roots, um, and it, it just, the plants do a lot better that way if they're together. Um, and then you want to plant in the fall because it started to cool down by then um, and you don't have to worry so much about watering. Our summers have been so crazy hot. It just does not work to, to plant plants in the summer because you are tending to them so much. Um, and our native plants really um, establish really well if you plant them in the fall um, once things start to cool down a bit. And that is the basics of native seed sowing. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Emily, thank you so much for going through all of that. Um, that was so clear and um, you covered so many different parts. We do have a bunch of questions um, and um, I'm going to start reading some for you to answer that I think kind of hit some of the themes that we're seeing both in the chat and in the, um, in the question and answers. I think Andrew will hopefully keep typing out answers in the Q and A where we can type them out and then Emily will respond to some of these bigger themes. So um, the first question was um, that I know many seedlings can be planted the following fall, but on the Wild Seed Project website, there's a photo of seedlings that are being under overwintered under remay cloth. Um, which seedlings need to be overwintered rather than planted? That's a great question. Um, so sometimes, you know, like I said, all plants are different. Sometimes you'll have plants that germinate, but don't grow big enough to be planted out into the garden. Um, it's not any species in particular, but that's when you would want to protect those plants for the winter because they're only little tiny babies. They're a lot more sensitive than um, a, a larger grown plant. So if, if that would be anything that germinated, but wasn't big enough to get into the ground. Um, and with that, I know online it says to do remain plastic. Nowadays, our our plants or our seasons are fairly mild. Um, I personally just do some reme over the plants um, with some paper or um, like uh, paper bags left over from the grocery store. Or I just use leaves. I have so many leaves in my yard um, that we pack a bunch of leaves around our plants and cover them with some reme or some sort of protective cloth um, and tuck them in. I call it tucking them in for the season. They go to bed. <laughs> and then once things start to warm up again, the big thing is once things start to warm up again, you really have to take the, that stuff off or the plants will cook. Um, and the other important thing about that is to wait until things are starting to freeze because otherwise um, rodents will find that as like the perfect nesting ground and they will make their way in. <laughs> okay, great. That's so helpful. Um, this was a quick question. Is it possible to use too much sand? Yes, um, I think generally when things go wrong, one of the big reasons is by using too much sand. Um, I say just test it out a bunch. Really a lot of seed sowing involves testing things. Um, I don't know anybody in the plant community who hasn't 
had a lot of failures and killed a lot of plants. So don't feel bad if it if they don't all work every time, because um, it is a technique that you just kind of get used to. You don't want to dump sand on um, some things. It might just take longer. Um, if you think about the seed bank in the wild, there are seeds in our soil, thousands of seeds, um, and it just takes a little bit of disturbance um, for those seeds to come up. Uh, and so like, just hold on if things aren't germinating. I tell people to just be patient, even though you think like it should have by now. Sometimes it might just take a couple of years. So that's another good one to know, but it is possible. Cool. Um, another one, this was a lot of questions about the plastic pots. And I think a lot of people are trying to think about the plastic that they use. And so both um, asking about sterilizing pots and asking about this new, um, idea of planting in milk jugs. So if you could speak on both of those, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, so sterilizing your pots is always important. Um, I just use a bleach and water solution. Uh, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of diseases that can be passed down. And then lately, everybody's concerned about the jumping worms um, that can easily sneak in on old soil from old pots. So it is important to sterilize your pots if you're going to reuse um, uh, plastic pots. Um, and yeah, milk jugs totally work. Um, some people do the, the milk jug thing where they cut the top and use it as like a mini greenhouse. Um, you don't really need to do that. You can just make them into pots. Um, if you were to do that, I would try to like get some snow in there. And, and like I said, be really aware of those fluctuating temperatures because that can cook a plant in a matter of hours. So <laughs> be careful about that part. But yeah, reusing plastic is totally fine. Just make sure you have drainage holes too. Great. Um, this was a question about the seeds and how long they stay viable if you are keeping them in the refrigerator or freezer. Um, well, it very much depends on the seed. That is a great question. Um, and like I said, with the seed bank, plants will live for years and years and years in the seed bank. Um, so really most of them will take, can last for, we don't really know how long. Um, we don't sell anything over a, a year or two old. Um, just in case uh, we just plant it all. We plant all of our old seed for our plant sale and for our demonstration projects and things like that. Um, but yeah, they will last quite a while. So if you got seeds and you didn't have time to plant them this year, they will be fine. Um, besides with the caveat of our, our seeds that are moist stratified. So a lot of our um, shrubs or fruiting trees um, and spring uh, species, they need to be sown right away because they need to be kept wet. So when we mail those out, they're in little Ziploc bags um, with wet vermiculite in them. Um, and then those, if those dry out, it will drop their germination rate by a lot. Um, I have still planted them after they shouldn't have been too great anymore and they all came up. So it is kind of like a, a swing game, but yeah, those are the only ones that you, you definitely wanna get them in the ground when you get them. Great. Um... And then this was an interesting question. Um, can you touch on the phenology whereby even though the species are the same, a seed from Maine is better to plant in the Northeast location than a seed from the Midwest because there's better success and less risk to native plants growing wild in the planting region? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah. There's a lot of different viewpoints on that. Um, that's kind of the, the ecotype idea. Um, we encourage people in like the Northeast to plant seed from Northeast adapted plants. So there's two different schools of thinking with that. And one of them is just those plants are going to be adapted for that, those conditions. Um, so they're going to be ready for our winters and our summers and our falls. Um, the other thought is the genetics of the plant. Um, there's, there's a mixed thinking there where, um, you want to promote the genes of the gene pool of your area, um, but there is the concern about um, funneling and inbreeding. So the whole reason we use wild plants or uh, wild seed is because we want to have um, a nice mix of genetics. That is what breeds adaptation. That's what will breed resilience in species. Um, so in cases of species that will go extinct, without bringing in outside genetics, it's a little bit different compared to um, species that you have a ton of them growing in your um, 
ecoregion or your climate. Um, and those are the ones that you're going to want to stick with, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's helpful. I think that it seems like there's that big conversation about ecotype. Um, yeah. And I will note there, like we are, we sell uh, New England, most, yeah, New England grown plants um, or seeds and mostly wild collected, but there are places all over the country that um, do a similar thing from us. Um, there's a bunch of Midwestern space places. So if you're not in this area, there are other options and there's learning your plants. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a question again about the seeds and what, if we have um, germination um, rates and, or if, if we have, yeah, if, if there's an expectation of what people can expect from the germination rate of a single packet and how many plants might come out of it. And I guess that depends on the size of the plant, but if you can, if you have ideas about that. Um, yeah, that's, that's one of the harder questions to answer. And it's something that we've been talking about a lot recently is just um, the fact that they are wild collected seed means that each seed is going to be genetically different from each other. Um, so it makes it really difficult to test a true idea of germination percentages like you can get with um, like a cultivar of lettuce where it can be tested and it, you can test the germination rate of thousands of seeds within a couple weeks. Um, so it's a little bit harder to test there. We um, sow what we call trial seeds of every seed that we collect for the year um, gets tested by our own sowing, like we sow them in pots um, and we make notes of what comes up and what doesn't come up, if the whole pot came up or didn't come up. Um, several of our seeds, it says online how many seeds come in a package. Um, most of them, it's around 100 seeds per package, 50 to 100. Um, and theoretically, those could all come up, <laughs> which means being prepared to potentially have a lot of plants. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of factors. There's a lot of abiotic factors that could reduce your germination or in help your germination success. Um, so it is a hard question to answer, but generally we, we get pretty good germination success and we do note it if um, any of our plants didn't come up. And we test all of our old, we plant, like I said earlier, we plant all of our old seed and that gen generally comes up and that's already past what date we sell them by. Great, that's so helpful. This is one last quick question um, before we close out of using burlap instead of wire mesh. Is that something you've tried? The thing about burlap is that rodents can get through it. <laughs> no problem. They can chew their way right into it. It kind of almost is inviting for them to they'll chew right into it. So it won't work as well. Actually, I'm going to send one more question because there was some question about this in general. This is kind of going back to the ecotype, but like how how far away does it make sense to be or like in what other areas does it make sense to still be buying seeds from the Wild Seed Project? Um, that is a hard question to answer, and it really depends on um, what you're doing with the seed and what your goals are. Um, and what like camp you land in on the ecotype question. Um, for garden seeds, I don't think it matters. A lot of the ecotype stuff is based on restoration work. And yes, potentially seed from far away could, they say it contaminates the wild seed. Um, I think we know that diversity breeds community stability. Um, that is an ecological theory, but fact, <laughs> um, and diversity is good. So genetic diversity is generally good, um, but you do wanna be careful. Like um, we don't sell uh, our native lupin seed to New Hampshire because New Hampshire has um, native populations that would be at risk of having their genes um, mixed up with non-native ones. And they have um, specific habitat that still has the endangered Carter blue butterfly. So there are times where it wouldn't be good. The big thing I would suggest is just research your area and find out um, what's best for, for your area and what plants are in your area. Um, and if you're using them for a garden versus restoration project, um, yeah. Great. Well, I think that that's all the time that we have. 
Um, I just want to shout out that Emily, thank you so much. You did such an amazing job and people in the chat are just really um, singing your praises that that was clear and concise and very, very informative. So thank you. And um, thank you all so much for joining us today. We had such a great time um, sharing this information with you. It's such a privilege to be able to be in this space, even when we're not all in the same space and share these awesome resources that we have. Um, if you want to know more about the Wild Seed Project or buy seeds so you can do the seed sowing, you can go to thewildseedproject.net where you can find tons of information and seeds and our emails if you have any other questions. You should be getting an email from me in the next, probably by Monday or Tuesday with the recording. Um, feel free to show it around to your groups of people, but we just ask that we're going to post it online so we can send out the posting and we just ask that other people don't post it. Um, and we, yes, oh, and if you are in the Portland um, slash generally Southern Maine area, um, we are selling seed sowing kits with the Maine Audubon. Um, where you can get all of the materials we showed here today, including the seeds. So you can go to Gillsland Farm. Oh yeah, and get that really cool tote that <laughs> Emily is showing up. It comes in the tote. Um, and so, yeah, we, we are excited to be partnering with them and um, you can get all of this here. And if you didn't feel like your answers were, or your questions were answered as fully as you were hoping, um, feel free to email us and we can do our best um, or check out the website. There's a lot of information there.